Well, it's November 1st, and uh, here we are again, this time with my uncle, our uncle, Wallace Hawes. And uh, uh, I want to thank Wallace. Thank you, Wallace, for being here. You're yes. welcome. I yeah. don't know how you snookered me into this, and I hope <laughs> I'm not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right, hopefully, and Elizabeth, of course. Yes, and nothing is nothing is undoable here. So <laughs> that's right. Don't we're worry. not we're not streaming live after all. And we right. are friendly. We're a friendly crowd. We want you to be comfortable with whatever comes out of this. So and it's I'm really really honest. good to have you here. Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> And I also want to formally, I want to thank that, that one person in our family that has enough faith in us to, to follow along and see, see if we're talking about anything <laughs> worth listening to, or they just love us. That is just really neat, you know, that our family loves us enough to, to join in. And then uh, we're going to talk about something that's a big spoiler, kind of. And so I'm going to put up uh, on the screen and down in the description a link to an 80 second video 81 second video that you need to watch if you don't want a big spoiler because here we go we're gonna dive in right wallace so turn take it away wallace okay well golly i'm just wondering of all the people that looked at that little video how many times did you get that they uh passed the basketball <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Tom? How many? I forget because the spoiler was so earth-shattering to me that uh, I have. How about no... you, <laughs> Elizabeth? You know, I watched it years ago for the first time, so I don't remember the okay. number of basketballs. Well, when I watched it, you know, I was confident I could. No problem. I'll count all those passes. No problem. One. <laughs> Two, three, four. And when it was all over, bam, I got it. And then the guy came on and he says, did you see anything unusual? Well, not really. Well, did you see the gorilla? What gorilla? Oh, you're lying. And so I went back and rewatched it. I, man, I fell for that hook, line, and sinker. So did I. Yeah. And in fact, it's interesting that uh, even knowing what is going to happen, I can go back and, you know, just psych myself up to say, look, you watch that basketball and I can do it again. I don't see the grill at all. That's interesting. I, I, I bet I could, too. I'll, you're right. <laughs> so this uh, little discussion today is about the book. Uh, the Invisible Gorilla. So uh, I'm going to read a few little things and then maybe we can talk about it. What do you think? Sounds good. Well, on page 13 of the book, it says, we think we should see anything in front of us, but in fact, we are aware of only a small portion of our visual world at any moment. The idea that we can look but not see is flatly incompatible with how we understand our own minds. And this mistaken understanding can lead to incautious or overconfident decisions. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, it's earth shattering. Earth shattering. It just so, well, so, uh, you know, I had only finished reading that part of the book, and, and uh, so I said, I went out driving with my wife, and I says, well, I can see everything. I'm going to be very observant and vig vigilant. So Edith's in the passenger seat. I'm driving, come to an intersection. Man, I look left. I look right. I look straight ahead. And... I punch on the gas to go. Well, Edith, fortunately, she was there. The gorilla, meaning another van, pulled right in front of me, uh, coming from the right. 
and I, she saved me from hitting that car. Well, that kind of thing happens all the time. You think you see it, but you don't, you don't see it. So this book is, it's gonna talk about some um, illusions that can get us into trouble. Yeah. Well, lay them on us. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> well, it right early on the book it uh, it talks about the cell phone talking in your car, uh, and we have the illusion. Oh, we can do it. We can do it. Uh, we're we're super intelligent, very very observant. And we even think, especially if your phone is connected to your speakers, well, there's something wrong with that because when you converse with another person riding in the car, they are aware of the same environment that you're in. So consequently, when you enter a challenging driving situation and stop speaking, your passengers, they quickly deduce the reason for your silence. There's no social demand for you to keep speaking because the driving context adjusts the expectations of everyone in the car. I'm reading from the book. Yeah, yeah. They, when you're, they, they know that it's time to stop talking. It's stressful. Exactly. But when you're on a cell phone, that other person doesn't know, but the social demand it's so strong, the conversation's got to keep moving, right? And so your brain is divided and it can create some very um, uh, hazardous situations. And of course, texting is incredibly dangerous. Don't even try it. Now, it's a little bit unrelated, but um, uh, and another possibility of an invisible gorilla is when I, I asked a lady at the food bank the other day when I was working there, she, she's a full-time professor of biology. And I said, uh, hey, have scientists come up with the recipe for life yet? You know, a cup of this, a teaspoon of that, a tablespoon of this, four cups of that, put it in the oven, preheat the oven, put it in, bake it for 10 hours, and then hit it with 50,000 volts and bingo, you have life. And she said, no. <laughs> but she explained another interesting thing about science. They send out all these probes all over the universe looking for life. Well, they, instead of looking outward, they turned their probe and looked at Earth. Can we detect life? <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was interesting that uh, they could not determine there was life on Earth. So it was, <laughs> it was totally a waste. But... She also made the observation that goes along with the invisible gorilla that maybe we're looking for the wrong thing. I mean, just because our life forms are based on carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, doesn't mean that life in uh, somewhere out there in the universe isn't based on something else. Yeah. You know? So the invisible gorilla. Any thoughts on that? Well, I have an overarching thought, but uh, but yeah, I mean, it's other than that, I'm just yeah, 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 yeah. We're not <laughs> yeah. okay. Well, uh, the next thing it brings up is the illusion of safety and numbers. Um, when when you're in a group. Uh, you immediately have an illusion that there's uh, safety. And so most members of the group are a um, little hesitant about expressing their own opinion. And so their ability to 
see reality is diminished. And uh, so it leads to the misguided intuition that the best way for a group to use is to use the ability of its members in solving a problem to, uh, to, deliberate, to deliberate over the correct answer and, and arrive at a consensus. And that brought to my mind my long history of serving in the church where uh, you always call a council, right? A bishopric council, high council, so that you can, as a group, deliberate what the best thing to do is. And this author makes the uh, statement that that is an illusion of council or numbers or it's an illusion because, for example, if the council is composed of some members who are high on the pecking order, those on the lower rung will more often than not agree with whatever the most influential people uh, have to say. And the first one to talk in a council meeting often sets, starts the ball rolling in a particular direction that only picks up steam as each vote is taken. If one or more of the council members are seen as experts in the area being discussed, those with less experience will often decline to voice a different opinion when in fact they may have the very new insight that is needed to solve that problem. I've seen it over and over. Yeah. 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 I, I no. noticed, uh, I noticed you mentioned in, in your book review, uh, uh, the notion of consensus, um, uh, with councils. And I noticed, uh, Occupy, uh, some of the left wing movements, Occupy and, um, like some of the intentional communities were, were thinking it would be really cool to use consensus as their decision-making uh, mechanism. And, and you discuss in your book review that that may not be an improvement over democracy, because at least in democracy, everyone puts their real opinion in. With consensus, you kind of eventually just got to go with what you're saying. Yeah. Good point. I thought, I thought it was really interesting that I, if when you have a, a council situation or a group situation, I guess, it in, seems like it would tend to, to um, keep things the way they are. Well, I think when you're in the, that situation, you want to be really careful that what you say doesn't come across making you sound stupid. Because you don't want other people. Yeah. I mean, so you come up with something new, you say it, that's a scary thing in that situation, uh, possibly, especially in a group that maybe tends toward like a council situation where there's someone in authority who has a particular opinion or where there's a certain way that it's always been done kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's not safe to put forth uh, new ideas because Everyone around you is like, you feel like they're judging your worth, the worth of you and your ideas and your brain and everything. And so you tend to do everything the same way. I And also, I think that it would tend toward skepticism because um, you wouldn't want to say, you know, like a similar thing, but just slightly different than what I was saying, that you wouldn't want to say, I'm believing this crazy thing. And I think we should maybe look at it because everyone else in the group is going to be like, no, you're just crazy. And, and again, it's just not a safe place to say, well, I think maybe we could do this a skepticism, different way. Skepticism toward trying new directions. Yeah. Or just anything. I, I mean, I, so I tend to think that people think skepticism is smarter than the other when you read uh i always go to the one star reviews on amazon i want to see what the people that really hate this have to say and then i judge what the one star people 
are saying. And if they're like, no, they're saying crazy stuff. I'm not going to pay attention to these one star reviews. Then I think, okay, it's probably an okay um, product. But if the one star reviews are obviously saying something, especially like in a book or something, an intellectual thing, I want to see what the people that hated it have to say. That's going to tell me a lot more about the book than what the people that loved it. But I think they're that's a bit of a tangent, but I think we tend to view people who are like, oh, I didn't like it because blah, 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 as being more intelligent than the ones that liked it, if that makes sense. And so in a group, you don't want to be the one that says, well, I think we can do this. I think we can blah, 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 when everyone else is like, no, that's not going to work. Because you're going to look like the dumb one who just doesn't get, you just don't understand all the problems. You just don't understand, you know, like why this is not a good thing. So I do think, yeah, I just, as you were talking, it's, it struck me that, yeah, maybe yeah. this would tend toward conservative and skeptical outcomes. Yeah, a little bit of a tangent, but uh, it does relate that it brings, suppose you are in a group of people that you're on a hike and you come to this deep canyon and it has a footbridge going across. And so the group gets together and uh, comes to the conclusion, hey, it's safe, we'll go. Well, is that necessarily the decision you would come to if you were all alone? And who is going to make the best decision? <laughs> it's an illusion to, uh, to automatically assume that the group is going to make the right decision for all the reasons we've talked about. In other words, the book is trying to get you to be alert of different illusions, and this is one of them, that the group is going to make a better decision than the one. Yeah. So here's an interesting one. It says, uh, the illusion of knowledge. The author relates several instances where governments have repeatedly planned huge projects and grossly underestimated the cost and time it would take to get the project done. When faced with a project with very complex elements and many moving parts, it is easy to fall into the illusion of knowledge that you can accurately predict how the project will proceed. And it includes in this part of the book that no battle plan survives the enemy. So the illusion of knowledge. So you're faced with a very complex thing. And I've fallen prey to this, you know, I, even in my business career, if if you want to do something bad enough, you could create a spreadsheet that will lie to you up the gazoo. You know, the spreadsheet itself doesn't lie, but it takes the numbers and it creates the curves and the performance <laughs> that you really want. And so over and over, governments and businesses and we as individuals, uh, uh, have the illusion that we've really figured this out. And and you make serious mistakes all the time. Yeah. Well, I, may, I, maybe I could share this overarching uh, thought. Um, it doesn't have to do with any one of the specific illusions as much as the general idea. And that is that uh, cognitive psychologist Donald Hoffman said, he says, an organism that is tuned to see things as they really are will never be able to outcompete an organism that's tuned just to see the fitness payoffs. So if you're playing a video game, you don't want to see the pixels and understand the source code. Not, not while you're playing. And when no. you're out to lunch, you don't want to think about your kidneys and your pancreas. Just want to enjoy the food and so it's this, that's a very in, over interesting overarching concept as we talk through these is if we it, 
it's kind of an interesting, scary proposition. A, an organism that can see everything all the time as it really is can't outcompete one that just sees the fitness payoffs. Yeah. Anyway. <clears throat> now, here's another illusion for you that I found very interesting is the illusion of pattern recognition. Our extraordinary pattern recognition abilities often serve us well, enabling us to draw conclusions in seconds or milliseconds that would take minutes or hours if we had to rely on laborious logical calculations. Unfortunately, they can also lead us astray, contributing to the illusion of cause. At times, we perceive patterns where none exist. We misperceive them where they do exist. Regardless of whether, whether a repeating pattern actually exists, when we perceive it, perceive that it does, is re we readily infer that it results from a causal relationship. Now, <clears throat> let me demonstrate that in this. In this book, it uh, brought up uh, some very interesting things. Uh, in 1994, a person by the name of Diana Drusier saw the face of the Virgin Mary in her cheesy grilled sandwich. And she eventually sold it five years later for $28,000 on eBay. And, there's another one, the Nun Bun, a cinnamon pastry was found in Nashville in 1996 that resembled the face of Mother Teresa. And it was sold in 2005. You can go on and look at it. Another one, there was some water stains on the underpass of a bridge. And uh, it, it was the Virgin Mary and it ended up disrupting traffic for months. They had to close down this underpass because people were just gathered to see the Virgin Mary. Um, <clears throat> it's the illusion of pattern recognition and, and I don't mean to discourage people of other faiths or you know, say anything bad about them because in my own religion, we kind of fall prey to the same thing with the illusion that uh, something happened because of this. Uh, coincidences that happen in our life uh, were caused because of the tender mercies of the Lord performing little merciful acts on our behalf or direct answers to prayers. Well, are those things really different than, than the nun bun or the Mary under the underpass of the bridge? In other words, we gotta be real careful of not falling prey to finding patterns that reinforce our bias or it, not recognizing that it could be an illusion. We're really good at that. <laughs> we're we're really really good at doing that thing. Be, but, um, and and it's actually difficult because we want to be grateful, and yet, uh, I mean, we don't we we don't mind erring on the side of generosity and being grateful, and yet, if we're trying to figure out what's real. Well, we got to be a little more careful. And, you know, a dramatic example is all the conspiracy theories that we see around. I mean, you've got people that are finding patterns that are, you know, the 9-11, the, the towers came down because, well, number one, they think some people go as far as say it was a government hoax, the government actually created those towers going down. And, you know, you just, you know, you think that what you see is caused by this. And, 
not explaining that very good, but it can get real out of hand. Well, that's just, I, I think we're, we're elaborating on the, what do they say, the logical fallacy, co correlation is not necessarily causation. Ad hoc ergo propter hoc. <laughs> so the book uses a kind of a humorous example of that. This town, it was invaded by bears. They were going through and overturning garbage cans and just wrecking havoc in town. And uh, so they put a police force out there to guard the town against the, the bears. Uh, well, a uh, little girl says, no, that's not what keeping the bears away. She says, this rock, she had a rock. She picked up, this rock is keeping those bears away. And the dad says, well, how do you know? Well, do you see any bears? No, well, then it's working. <laughs> kind of a silly little example, I guess. Well, no, it's really good because we, we do that. <laughs> There's... Here's another one. I, uh, early on in our marriage, I planted this sunflower, a giant sunflower that was right next to our front door. And I had read a book about, you know, you play music or you treat a plant good, it's going to grow. And if you treat it bad and play terrible music, it's going to have an effect on that plant. So one day I walk as I'm walking in the door, I grab that sunflower by the neck and I you terrible ugly sunflower. And then I went in the house. Well the next day I come out and that plant is swelled over dead. Or it it, it it bent over and it was dying. <laughs> so the the cause and effect would say, yeah, that plant it really it really uh got offended and didn't feel the love and so it died. And, and the scientific thing to do would to be to derive a hypothesis. What what your hypothesis is that, that doing what you did wilted the flower and then you run some studies and you find out if that's the case. And because it very well could be the case, it's not there's we don't know it's not the case. We don't know it is the case. You could have uh, damaged the, the, the sunflower, or you may not have, right? That's the very point he's trying to make, is we, we uh, go around all day long falling prey to illusions. Where, you know, let's not just assume the illusion has a cause and effect. Let's go do the little study and find out if it's true. So here's another illusion. Uh, you know, when I was a young man playing basketball, I noticed that when I was sitting in the on the bleachers, if I stared just right at the pitcher, he would pitch ball after ball, and the men would all walk the bases. <laughs> anyway, when it when it didn't seem to work, well, I said, well, maybe I need to sit on my hands. And so I'd do it again. <laughs> well, it worked over and over. I was convinced I had some power that, you know, it was crazy. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Ready for another one? Yep. Okay. The illusion of potential. Oh, we fall prey for this all the time. I don't know. Uh, do you believe, let me just ask both of you, do you believe that if you play Mozart, the music of Mozart, to your little kids growing up, that they're going to turn out to be smarter? I'm not sure if I believe that or not. I have definitely heard that. I don't know. And I have classical music on the way to school when my going to school not necessarily thinking oh this is going to make them smarter but it's a good way to start the day <laughs> yeah 
but there are a lot of people that believe that hook, line, and sinker, and they spend a lot of money on, on that illusion. Uh, there's other ones like uh, you listen to the right tapes when you're asleep. You know, you're going to hear these messages over and over, and it's going to improve your intelligence or it's going to prove your ability to quit smoking or or whatever you know that there's just uh gimmick after gimmick uh, of quick fixes uh that are advertised and sold as illusions of potential and so it, the author is just trying to help us realize, look, <laughs> these could possibly be illusions. Go check it out. <laughs> you know, find evidence and real proof. So how about this one? Most people only use 10% of their brain capacity. <laughs> you ever heard that one? I have heard that. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Well, the author, he says, now, wait a minute, let's think about that for just a second. If, if your brain tissue has no activity whatsoever for an extended period of time, that brain dies. I mean, that's a scientific fact. Uh, and so there's no reason to think. I mean, if even if you believe in... Uh, God is the creator. There's no reason to think that God would say, well, look, he only needs 10% of his brain. We're going we're gonna to create 90% of this brain tissue that is of no use whatsoever. And it was, I've heard it before, and I actually believed it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Me too. Me too. How about... Uh, well, you know, I put one in called this illusion of superstition. This was not in the book, but it just dawned on me. He needed one in there called the illusion of superstition. It might be another way of expressing the idea of false association of patterns, false cause and effect that catches on in communities or groups that it eventually develops into strong superstitions which have no basis in fact, but it is believed with all the heart and the head anyway. Uh, and the tragedy of the witch hunts that spread across Europe and America that cost 40 to 50,000 lives is a good example. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, and it was a collective illusion of superstition. Which was probably based on the ad hoc ergo propter hoc, which I can't remember what you called it, the illusion of um, the patterns, like where you said, my cat yeah. was sick after she came and visited and exactly. gave my cat the evil eye. And yeah. Yeah, it it's kind of like the illusion of superstition kind of arises from all these, as you, as you mentioned, Wallace, we have. Yeah. We have the scientific method. It's really hard to do. It, it works. It's extremely difficult to do. And we don't really, we've got it. I mean, it's a lot easier just to go with, uh, you know, your illusions. Uh, you know, and a lot of times we don't have scientific experiments about your sunflower or the cat <laughs> uh, crossing the path. And so we just jump to these conclusions because that's what we do. Right. Uh, here's another one. Um, especially when you're getting older, you, you know, I get I worry about my cognitive abilities just going away, and I won't even be able to be on these silly podcasts anymore. <laughs> <laughs> And so how do you keep your cognitive skills uh, alert? Well, there are more pills, gimmicks, uh, you know, take the Prevagen, 
you know, medications or, or whatever, quick fixes to maintain your cognitive abilities. And most of them out there are flat out unscientific lies to make a buck uh, at the expense of the older population. And uh, he makes the points that the scientific uh, uh, facts are that one of the best things that you can, well, let me back up a second. The illusion is that if you have, that if you teach chess in school, playing chess will improve your intelligence, uh, those kinds of things. Well, there, there is absolutely no scientific evidence to that, according to the author. Uh, if you play Sudoku every night before you go to bed, you're, it's going to improve your cognitive abilities. Well, it does nothing but sell a lot of Sudoku books or whatever, but it doesn't improve cognitive abilities. He claims the science is that uh, physical exercise is the head and shoulders above anything in maintaining uh cognitive abilities. And for older people, that usually means a good brisk walk for 30 minutes a day. Go, everybody go on a walk. That, that's what yeah, I've everybody. Heard. The best health advice, and I don't do this, but that's, I've heard that's the best health advice, go on a walk. Go on a walk. And it was also an eye opener to me. I've always downplayed uh, video games. I said, those video games, that, what a waste of cognitive abilities. And, but you know what? The scientific, uh, well, let me back up a second. Uh, the illusion is that playing chess will have increased cognitive abilities in broader areas of your life, not just chess. It will spill over to your cognitive abilities everywhere. Well, that's been found to be an, an illusion. So uh, video games, what does that do to your brain? Well, <laughs> the side, according to this author, uh, the scientific evidence is that video games actually increase your cognitive abilities across a wide spectrum. It's like pouring in sugar in a recipe and stirring it up. It spills over into all areas of your cognitive skills, which I found a little disappointing and unsupportive of my theory that video games are harmful. <laughs> oh, dear. Just well, because you think, yeah, it's so ingrained that chess is going to be a smarter choice for your kids than to let them sit and play video games. <laughs> yeah. So let's see. <clears throat> let's skip to intuition. This was a really good one. The illusion of intuition. What we intuitively accept and believe is derived from what we collectively assume and understand, and intuition influences our decisions automatically and without reflection. Intuition tells us that we pay attention to more than we do, that our memories are more detailed and robust than they really are, that confident people are more competent people, <laughs> that they really know more than they do. Anyway, on and on, the illusion of intuition gets you into trouble. Uh, and the example that he used is the president of a company. He was known for his abilities to make snap, snap judgments. Let's make a decision and bam, go. And he was basing it on a lifetime of experience, but it was intuition. All these complicated facts were put in front of him. And he ignored his advisors, you know, his marketing staff, everybody. My intuition says, do this. And they did. And they lost their shirt. 
because he believed in his intuition. We got to be real careful about believing in intuition. I've been Here's thinking, another. I've been thinking ahead. a lot about uh, intuition uh, recently, and 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 I I'm trying to incorporate it more. There are things our, our brains are very limited. And there are times when intuition is much faster and effective. I, I personally believe it's really important it not contradict what I know to be important or real or true. Uh, you know, I, I, I know that it's not so, but there are a lot of things I don't know where intuition is, is really important to pay attention to. So that guy, I mean, he should have listened to his advisors, you would think. So, you know, it comes to mind, there's lots of time, there are a lot of times in life where you have to make a decision and you have to make it right now. Well, sometimes all you got to have to go on is intuition, but you're taking a chance. If if at all possible, if you can just say, oh, slow down, let's think about this, let's gather some more data, you will always come out better in the end. But it's not always available to us, that's true. Oh, it, it yeah. mentioned the, the, the illusion of confidence. The illusion of confidence, and it talked about uh, Frank Abernathy. Remember I him? watched that movie. Catch me if you can. Yes, catch me if you can. Incredible. And uh, so, who would you rather go to a doctor? A doctor that he takes his diagnosis, and he, he's and within. Couple of minutes here. This is what's wrong with you. I've seen it a thousand times. You've got to do this. Would you rather go to that guy or the doctor that says, wow, you know, I need to go study this out. I need to go read the medical journals. I, I'm not sure. Well, who do you go to? Me personally, I go to the second one every time. The first <laughs> okay. one, the first, I've had too many bad experiences with the first one. He's not even listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's the illusion of confidence. You need to be real careful about that. But I would guess that the first one makes a lot more money. <laughs> because he said 10 patients to the one. Yeah, and I think some people really are like, that's what they want. They want someone who's going to tell them what to do. I tend to be like, don't try to tell me what to do with my body. Let's talk about this. <laughs> but, but not everybody's like that. So, yeah. Well, there's all kinds of illusions. Uh, there's, I'll just list them. The illusion of attention, thinking you can multitask. The illusion of knowledge, thinking you know more than you really do. The illusion of authority, authority, thinking that guy, he, just because he has president or uh, in front of his name, he's going to be right. Or the illusion of memory, that you really remember things the way they are. It's been, pro been proven over and over that people cannot remember worth a darn. And they recreate their memories. Every time you think about a memory, you recreate it. Uh, illusion of confidence, the illusion of certainty. Uh, you got to maintain an open mind about things and don't fall into the, the illusion of dogmatism. Uh, I mean, the illusion of certainty can get you into trouble. Uh, the illusion of potential, thinking that someone can do a quick fix, the illusion of intuition. Uh, the illusion of agency. Now, here's a, oh man, this is a whole book review. The book doesn't mention it, but after reading the book, The Hi Happiness Hypothesis, it may be a total illusion how much of what we consciously have control over in our life. 
The invisible, it, 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 Gorilla, we don't see maybe that much of what we do has already been determined with or without our conscious input by the elephant that we're riding. He's made the decision. You're the rider, you're the attorney riding on the back and you're coming up with all these reasons and justifications for what the, for what the elephant is doing. It's all an illusion. But that's a whole new book review. Maybe the next one, uh, <laughs> Happiness Hypothesis. <laughs> well, this, this all calls for a lot of humility about our faculties. That it does. That it does. Let We've me... got to be a little more patient, a little less judgmental, uh, be more deliberate about what we think and do. Uh, but, you know, on the other hand, if you take all the time in the world, you may miss out on some of the greatest adventures I've ever had. Right. I, I mean, this, this, <laughs> this, I, this, this idea makes it easier for me to talk about politics um, because, gee, you know, I'm not absolutely sure about very many things. I wish we had more time, but being able to talk at all is important. Yeah, True. thanks for being willing to do that. We appreciate it. Good to be with you and see you. Okay, maybe another time. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.